Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is Mill Skills, a series of quick videos on getting started with your vertical mill. If you're new to machining, I'm going to suggest you check out my Lathe Skills series. It covers the fundamentals of machining, but if you just got a vertical mill and you bolted it to your bench and you don't know what to do next, you're in the right place. This is episode two, setting up your mill. Okay, let's dive in. Okay, you got your shiny new mill or your new to you mill off of the pallet and up on the bench or in the corner of your shop. You're very excited to go make some chips. You're ready to go, right? Well, no, not quite actually. There's some setup things that you need to do. Uh, first and foremost is tramming the head. And tram basically refers to the angle of the spindle relative to the table. And uh, even if you bought your mill brand new, it may have some kind of tram on it from the factory, but it's probably not gonna be perfect. And uh, if the mill was trammed a long time ago, you know, cast iron settles and it settled in when you were moving it. And so uh, it may be out a little bit. So. Uh, we need to go ahead and tram the head. Now a basic mill like this one uh, will have a tilt adjustment on the head. Uh, more complex and larger mills will also often have a nod on the head and uh, so you need to basically zero out both of those. So your typical hobbyist mill is only going to have a tilt adjustment and not a nod and there will be a scale under here and some number of bolts that are holding this angle. So uh, you're going to need to loosen these guys up a little bit and then set this guy to zero. But before you do that, let's check and see where the tram is right now. So the goal of tramming is to get this angle right here to be as close to 90 as possible. And you'll recall from high school geometry that the best way to do that is to go as far out here as possible so we get the most resolution on that angle that we can. Now measuring that angle directly is fairly difficult, but what we can do is measure the height of the table on either side of the spindle and when those two height measurements are the same, then we know this angle is 90 degrees. Now there are fancy and expensive special purpose tools for measuring tram on a mill head, but you can also just do it with our old friend, the humble dial test indicator and some sort of fixture to hold this guy out here and out here. So you can make one of these guys literally out of scrap or whatever you got lying around. You can also adapt an indicator arm. Basically, you just need something that will go in your spindle, in this case I've sized it for a three quarter inch collet. So it goes in the spindle like so, and it holds the dial test indicator in the end like so. And this will allow us to swing the indicator evenly back and forth and take a measurement on each side of the table. Okay, so I've got my tramming fixture set up here. And uh, as you can see, I had to remove the vise for this demonstration, which was a deeply emotionally painful experience. So I hope you appreciate what I'm doing for my YouTube audience. And that vise was perfectly indicated and had not moved for six months, but uh, well, here we are. Now the question of how long this arm should be is an interesting one. I've got it basically the full length of the working area of my table. Uh, the longer this arm is, the more precise your tram will be, but also the more time you'll spend chasing those last couple of tenths. Uh, the, the measurements are gonna be a lot fussier out here, uh, but if you make it too short, then your, your tram isn't gonna be very precise. So uh, in, in theory, uh, I like to get within say a thousandth over the entire length of the table. And then I know anything in my typical working area is gonna be much, much better than that. And uh, that allows me to sleep at night. Okay, so I've brought the head down uh, until my indicator is touched up here. And uh, I'm actually gonna adjust the height of the head a little bit just to zero that guy out. And now I can just go ahead and swing this guy around to the opposite corner of the table. Okay, and we're reading about five thousandths here. So uh, this is actually good. My uh, head actually does need a little bit of tramming. So uh, we can go ahead and do that. Now I'm using opposite corners of my table here because my mill only has a tilt on it. If your mill has a nod, then you want to use two points that are on the same X axis uh, so that you're only measuring the tilt of your head. And then when you go to do the nod, you have to do this same process again using two points that are aligned on the Y axis of your table. Okay, so I've gone ahead and broken those bolts loose under there. Now you just wanna break them, don't actually loosen them because you still want everything held in place snugly. And then we're gonna move it by tapping it with a rubber mallet. So uh, I've, I've got a zero reading on one side and somewhere around four thousandths on this side. 
And much like uh, dialing something in in a four-jaw chuck, you're basically trying to split the difference because as you rotate the head, one reading will increase and one reading will decrease, and you want them to land on the same reading, so you want to move it half the distance between those two readings. So to figure out where you need to hit it, you can just move the indicator needle with your hand, and I can see that moving it up will go in the direction I want, so that means the head needs to rotate this way because that will drive the needle down that way, and so I'm going to be tapping it over here. And it goes without saying, but mind what you're hitting. Make sure it's something cast iron. Don't hit the electrical box or, you know, the sheet metal cover on the motor or something like that. Okay, so I've got it within half a thou over this length, which I'm happy with. And now the trick is we have to tighten the head back down uh, but it's likely to move when we do that. This is the cruel reality of where physics meets machining. So what we're going to do is try to tighten these bolts in an even pattern and uh, very gradually to try to keep it from moving as we do this. And then we can check it again. And if it moved, then we need to do this over again. And luckily, it actually tightened in a little better. So uh, I'm actually within a few tenths end to end. So uh, I'll uh, make sure those guys are all good and tight. But uh, yeah, our head is now trammed, and that's a great feeling. And then as I said earlier, if your mill has a nod, then you will need to do this process again on the y-axis using a shorter arm and two points to check tram on your table that are aligned on the y-axis of your table. Okay, with the head all trammed in, now we're ready to set up our vise. But before you do that, let me give you a little thought experiment. Don't be afraid to think outside the vise. You know, we think of uh, vices on mills and lathes on chucks as required equipment, but uh, in fact, both of those are just optimizations for the table and the faceplate, respectively. Every single operation can be done by clamping your work directly to the table or directly to the faceplate. The vice just makes a lot of things a lot easier. So uh, if you're having trouble with a setup, sometimes it's helpful to remember that uh, the table is actually uh, your first principle when it comes to clamping material. So don't be afraid to use it. So first, make sure the underside of your vice is clean and uh, be careful with this with these things these are very heavy uh, even a little six inch vise like this guy is really heavy and uh, you really got to watch yourself so if it's uh, a brand new vise it's likely going to have cosmoline or some ver version on the underside so you want to clean that off with like wd-40 or brake cleaner and uh, if like this it's a it's an older vise that's been on and off a bunch of times it's just going to have oil and other crud uh, under here so you want to clean all of this off And if you have any dings in the bottom of the vise, you'll be able to feel them, and you can uh, get those out with a stone. But everything feels good there. This is important because uh, any, any debris or anything under here is going to make the vise less accurate. It's going to introduce error to every single thing you do with that vise. And of course, same goes for the table. It's got to be spotlessly clean. If there's any dings in there, you want to stone those out before proceeding. And then very carefully lift your vise onto the table, being careful not to ding anything, because once again, these guys are not light. Okay, and you obviously want to get it kind of centered on the table. Now I'm securing this guy with kind of a cartoonish stack of hardware here because this vise isn't a perfect fit for this mill. But uh, yeah, whatever you've got, go ahead and install all of your hardware. And now it's time for the job that every machinist dreads, which is why it's emotionally painful to remove your vise. Uh, we need to indicate this vise, and the goal is to get a dial test indicator to have the same reading at both ends of the jaw as we slide the table back and forth. And what that will mean is that this jaw is parallel to the head as it moves, and so it will make parallel cuts along our x-axis. And since the vise is itself very square, by extension, the y-axis will also be square. Now what makes this job so tricky is that the thing that we're indicating, the fixed jaw of the vise, is entirely inboard and also offset from the points of rotation. So what that means is when we tap on this vise to rotate it, the jaws are actually both moving together and they're describing an arc like this rather than 
pivoting around one point. So normally when you're indicating something, you can tap one side of it and one measurement goes up and one measurement goes down in a predictable way and you can just split the difference between those measurements and you land where you want. However, in this case, the thing that we're indicating is describing a strange kind of arc. And this is why indicating the vise is so much trickier than, for example, tramming the head or, you know, dialing in a four-jaw chuck or other types of indicating tasks. And uh, so that's led to the development of a, a technique called walking in the vise, where you kind of go back and forth and each time you make an adjustment you adjust it less than you think you need to based on the indicator and you very gradually close in on a zero reading on both ends. That's tricky and takes a lot of experience but there is an easier way. So here's the simple trick that makes this job 10 times easier. Instead of indicating on the fixed jaw of the vise, put a parallel in the vise and indicate on the ends of the parallel and choose a parallel that is at least as long as the distance between the mounting bolts on the vise or even a little longer is good and by indicating out here now we're indicating past this pivot point here and we choose one side to pivot from and we leave this guy snug and then we loosen the other guy and we rotate the vise around this pivot point and because this parallel here is out past this pivot point this reading is always going to go down and the other reading is always going to go up and so it's going to behave much more like a traditional indicating job now there's still a little bit of a weirdness because we're still uh, in front of the point of, ro of rotation so both sides are still swinging an arc but uh, uh, this will make the job a whole lot easier as I'll show you right now And as I worked my way across, uh, as I got more than five or six thou out, I tapped it in to zero and then continued. And that kept my indicator from ever getting too far out of range. Because when you start this, it's going to be probably further out of square than your, test dial, than your dial test indicator can register. So with that zeroed in now, I'm going to carefully tighten these bolts up. And uh, I'm going to first snug up the non-pivoting side to the same tension as the pivoting side was. Which this guy was... I tightened it and then I backed it off just a, a, a skitchen. Okay, and as you do this, it's going to move a little, so it moved a half thou right there. So you're going to try to tighten these up evenly. And as I tighten this side up, it comes back a little bit, so I'm going to try to tighten up evenly so that it doesn't move. And usually you have to maybe do this one more time, because it's going to move a little as you tighten it. but. Sometimes if you carefully tighten it evenly on both sides, you get lucky and you're a happy machinist. All right, so after that first pass, uh, I tightened everything down and it moved half a thou. So I did one more pass where I loosened the bolts just slightly, tapped it in again, tightened it down evenly, and now we are right on zero at both ends. So I hope you can see there how using that parallel to get your indicator out to the pivot points really makes this a whole lot easier than the traditional walking it in method. And I learned this trick from Mr. Pete, so thank you very much Mr. Pete, and I'll link to his video. And uh, there's a variation on this technique of tapping it in as you move it that actually uses the power feed, and uh, that was really well demonstrated by Tom over at Tom's Techniques, so I'll link to that here as well. Now technically this process is less precise than indicating directly on on the fixed jaw uh, because of course the parallel itself might not be perfect and there could be a tiny chip between the parallel and the jaw so uh, there is you know some amount of error introduced by that but uh, I think you'd be hard-pressed to see that error on a tenth style test indicator and uh, while I might get fired from the spaceship factory or the heart valve factory for doing this here in my hobby shop this is definitely worth the convenience. For full context there, first time I tried the walk in the vice method, I think it took me about 45 minutes to do it. Uh, the first time I tried the Mr. Pete parallel method, it took me about two minutes. So this is the method I'm gonna recommend you try as well. Now, whether you're talking steak or whiskey, vices are very important to the machinist. So let's talk a little bit about the nature of this beast. 
Now, the most fundamental thing on the vise is this guy right here. This is your fixed jaw, and it's right there in the name. This jaw is fixed to the body of the vise, and then the body of the vise is fixed to your table. This is critical because the fixed jaw is your reference surface on the machine. It establishes the relationship between all of your work pieces and the spindle. And in machining, error is a transitive property. So what that means is it gets transferred from step to step to step as you go along, and it accumulates over over each of those steps. So in this case, you know, the fixed jaw is sitting on this vise, which is sitting on this table. And if any of these relationships have error in them, that error will be telegraphed into your part. So that's why it's important to have a high quality vise because then you can trust these relationships in here. And it's important to mount your vise properly so that you can trust these relationships in here. And that's why it's also valuable to not have swivel bases or other things under your vise because those are introducing new relationships and new potential sources of error. But the clever thing about indicating on the fixed jaw and the reason that we do it that way is that by indicating directly from the spindle to the fixed jaw, we can effectively cancel out all these sources of error uh, because this is the rela relationship that we ultimately care about, the one between the work and the spindle, and the fixed jaw is what's aligning our work to the spindle. So if we know these two are aligned, then we can trust the rest of this system. And now you also know why you'll often see machinists working over here in the corner of the table. If they're doing a fixture on the table, if they're setting up a rotary table like that, you'll see them going out of their, out of their way to stay clear of this vice because once you've got this guy set up uh, and, and you trust that it's indicated in well you really don't want to move it because well it's a lot of work to get back to where it is once properly indicated you can finally learn to open up your heart and trust that vice it's up to you how far you let that trust take you all right i'm going to leave it right there for now and i'm going to let you spend some quality time with your vice get to know each other learn if it leaves wet towels on the floor and next time, we are actually going to make some chips, so tune in again for that. Thank you very much for watching.